last pitch of uh, 2020. The event where all the PhD students, where the PhD students of Politecnico di Torino can discuss their research topics with the IEEE members of our IEEE community. For today, we will have three speakers, which are Antonio, Davide, and uh, Elisa. And uh, we will have, of course, three talks. And between one talk and the other, we will have some question and answer time. So if you have questions, please just write your questions as usual in the comments of the YouTube live video and we will ask the questions for you. I remind to the students in electrical electronics and communications engineering, the PhD students, that they can, fa they can fill the form and obtain some uh, hard skill hours credits. So the first speaker of today is uh, Antonio. And um, Antonio will give a speech about wearable brain computer interfaces for daily life applications. Antonio Esposito received his master's degree in electronics engineering at Uni Università degli Studi di Napoli, Federico II, in 2017. He worked on applying methodology, met metrology for semiconducting cables and magnetic measurements at CERN in Geneva. Then in 2018, he became a PhD student in metrology at Politecnico di Torino, where he works on biomedical measurements. In particular, he studies and develops wearable brain-computer interface for daily life application. Please, Antonio. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you for the presentation. So I can share my screen, first of all. And uh, yes, as Yuri said, my presentation today is about brain-computer interfaces, and in particular, the possibility to use these systems in daily life applications. Uh, to this aim, an important feature is indeed wearability, but we will see that there are also other aspects to care about. So um, in a nutshell, in this talk, I will first give some uh, general concepts on brain computer interfaces. And then I will show you two examples of uh, systems. The first one is uh, based on evoked potentials. And the second one is based on spontaneous brain activity. Uh, of course, this is uh, my point of view on the topic, but hopefully we will have some hints on how to build uh, these systems for daily life applications. So we can start uh, with what is a brain computer interface or BCI for, for short. Uh, this is a system in which we measure the brain activity from the scalp of the user. And uh, a technique is, for example, the electroencephalography. And once we have acquired these signals, we can process them. In processing, uh, we typically distinguish two steps. The first one is the extraction of features that are uh, synthetically uh, describing the activity. And the second step is the translation of these features into control commands, so control signals for the application of interest. In the end, the application will give a feedback to the user. Um, you can uh, say that something like that uh, is useful for people with motor disabilities. Uh, it has been proposed also in rehabilitation protocols or other clinical applications. But today, they are also proposed as new tools uh, for able-bodied people, uh, because you can use them for gaming, for example, or in industry as a new tool to interact with your surrounding environment. So if historically the motivation is basically clinical or medical, also the European framework Horizon 2020 already says that not only you can replace or restore the lost uh, output of the central nervous system, but you can also enhance, supplement or improve it, as well as you can do some research with it. So these are research tools to further investigate the brain functions. If now we want to apply such a technology in daily life, there are some constraints that we have to fulfill. And so these are also some keywords to keep in mind in building the system. The first one is indeed the non-invasiveness. And when we speak of non-invasiveness, mainly we intend that we cannot put electrodes inside the scalp of the user, but we have to use something like the EEG that records the electrical activity, the brain activity from uh, the surface of the scalp. Then there is uh, the wearability, as we were saying also at the beginning. But together with the wearability, we have also to consider the portability. Because for example, in the picture, you see something that is indeed wearable, but I will not say this is portable. While if you want to use it in daily life, you have to bring the stuff with you. 
And then another important thing is that you need low cost. Of course, this is a feature that we would like for everything, but uh, especially in the brain computer interfaces, which is not uh, a young topic, but it is uh, still in an early state, you need something to be easily spreadable. So at the end, you have to consider something like commercial devices like that, um, which are composed of some electrodes that are typically dry, so they do not use conductive gels to measure the brain activity. Let's say that this is almost all from the point of view of the hardware, even though these aspects that I'm discussing also concern a bit the processing. But regarding processing, there is another important aspect, that is the need of training. Because the algorithm that is decoding uh, the neural activity uh, must train somehow on the subject, as well as the subject has to train so that the algorithm can recognize his intention. Um, to make an example, this is like when you use a speech synthesizer on your smartphone. Um, before using it at the very beginning, there is the need to say some phrases. Well, you don't want to say hours and hours of phrases because this is capable to recognize your voice. And in the same way, when you use a brain computer interface, you don't want to acquire EEG for hours before it is capable to understand what you're thinking. And so the minimal training is one of the important aspects for a daily life application. And finally, a trivial constraint is that the system must be performant enough. Of course, this is true for every system, but I have to stress this point because the previous constraints are limiting too much the performance sometimes. And so you have always to keep an eye to the success rate of the instrument in understanding what you're thinking, let's say. To sum up, you want to become like him, because if you see Iron Man is a very simple neural interface that works very well to control his robots. So given uh, these general concepts, we can start to see the first system. And in this first system, uh, we can say this is a reactive brain computer interface in the sense that the user is staring at an icon that is flickering. And because uh, of this flickering, uh, the reaction is Um, augmented reality glasses for the presentation of the flickering icons. So uh, this is uh, the way in which uh, we stimulate the user. And then uh, um, the user from the meteorological point of view is seen as uh, a transducer because the luminous intensity of the icons is uh, translated into electrical activity. And we can measure this electrical activity. Uh, the choice in the design was to employ a simple setup that is uh, a component of the shelf, so you can find uh, available online. And it has just two electrodes that measure with a single differential channel brain activity. At the end uh, here, there is a bit of signal conditioning and acquisition. And the important thing is that the digitized signal goes back to the microprocessor of the augmented reality glasses so that you can process them. So the important takeaway is that the hardware is just composed of two components of the shelf. And with that, that is relatively low cost, you can build the whole BCI system, but you have, of course, to uh, care about the processing. Regarding processing, it is very convenient to analyze these kind of signals in the frequency domain because you can recognize some peaks. And these peaks are present at the same flickering frequency of the icon. So you can characterize in terms of features your signal by just calculating the power, for example, at 10 Hertz and at 12 Hertz, and understand that the signal on the left is associated to a 10 Hertz flickering icon. The signal on the right is associated to a 12 Hertz flickering icon. With this method, in principle, you do not need any training. So this will be a training-free brain-computer interface. But if you add a minimal training, there is also the possibility to fine tune the system on the specific user. This is what we did actually in a case study application. And in this application, the user is wearing the system 
to monitor the condition of an industrial oven. So in this case, classically, you would use something like a tablet and you would click some icons to have, for example, the temperature of the oven or the humidity of the oven. With this system, instead, user just watches at an icon and requires data because, for example, uh, in the meanwhile, his hands are busy. And so just by looking at the icon, you will have the information you need. In this case study, we also tested the performance of the system with 20 subjects. And we can see that uh, if the icons are flickering for two seconds, the classification accuracy, so the success rate in recognizing the intention of the user is about 80%. This is not bad, but it can be better, of course. And actually, um, some other developments that a colleague of mine conducted have reached something like 90% if you have two seconds long flickering icon, or if you decrease the flickering time because it is too long a two second window to activate an icon, with one second, you keep the accuracy more or less about 80%. So this system is working quite well, but there is a problem. So there is a, the problem of the need of stimulation. And we asked ourselves, what if we use some other paradigm that is not reactive, but is active. So it's based on spontaneous brain activity in which you do not need a stimulation. This is the case, for example, of motor imagery. In motor imagery, you uh, imagine a movement without executing it, and you focus on something like the kinesthetic sensation of the movement. And because of that, in your brain, some patterns are activated. So the energy is concentrated on one lobe or the other of the brain, depending on what you're imagining. The challenge in this case is to detect this activity, so to detect how the energy in the brain is distributed spatially. We can understand that now it's not so easy to use a single channel device as before. So the first thing to understand was how many channels do we need, how many electrodes do we need to um, acquire properly the brain activity. We started then with a channel selection and for this channel selection, we also used a different processing approach than before. So on the left, you see that the processing approach has some filter banks that are doing something similar to the SSVP case. They are filtering in a specific band and you try to understand which is the power in that band. But then there is also this CSP that is a common spatial pattern that is an structure or features that tries to understand where is located in the space, the energy and so what are you are thinking. And then there is something like feature selection or the classification. But another thing that is very important to stress is that here you need explicitly a training and then there is the evaluation phase or the use phase in which you can actually use the system. So now with the motor imagery, we have eliminated the need of stimulation, but we need more channels and we need the training. Regarding the number of channels, for example, we studied the trade-off between the number and the performance. And if we want a performance that is quite compatible, let's say with the old channels case for this benchmark data set, we have to stay around six, eight channels. With six, eight channels, we attain something like 75% of classification accuracy, which is still lower than before. And so we see that we are losing something to gain in eliminating the simulation. After this benchmark study, we also tried to apply this uh, to a wearable helmet. So we tried uh, to use uh, only eight dry electrodes with a wireless cap. And the thing that we discovered was that uh, if the subject is not trained, it is very difficult to, to have a performance system. So you see in the figure that, for example, the subject one, after some runs in which uh, he was doing a motor image and the system was acquiring and trying to classify, mm, the performance are, are increasing. So you see the blue line. But if you see the red line, which represents another subject, this one is not increasing and is not improving in terms of performances. And what's bad is that these performances are around 50%. So it's like to say that the system is guessing at random which um, imagery the user is conducting. Um, among the various uh, problems that there are that are limiting in the performances, we um, thought that uh, the problem is that it is very difficult to imagine a movement without having any feedback. 
So the next thing that we are doing uh, still now is to provide a neurofeedback. The concept of the neurofeedback is that while the user is imagining something, we are also providing something related to this brain activity. And in particular, we are providing a visual feedback in terms of a ball that moves to the left or to the right, depending on the decoded activity. And then we are also providing an haptic feedback. So a simulation with uh, vibration motors on the torso that uh, are uh, involving still the sensory motor area where the motor imagery mainly happens. This is still work in progress and we are working also with the Houston University and we will see if this can really help in uh, building a, a performance device. But what's uh, the focus here is that the feedback is still provided with wearable and portable stuff because you see a vest to wear on the torso and you see something that is visual feedback that can be implemented on the AR glasses on or virtual reality visors. So to conclude, how can we build a wearable brain computer interface for real life applications? Well, if you consider the active paradigm, um, we found that we can build a highly wearable uh, device and also a relatively low cost. And this is also in accordance with the literature at the end, because with a reactive paradigm, you don't have so much problems, let's say. But still, we need to increase the performance uh, because, as you saw, the accuracy can be unacceptable for some applications. On the other hand, if you want to use an active paradigm because uh, of the important uh, advantage of uh, eliminating the simulation, you need typically more channels. And uh, uh, what's worse is that you need lots of training for both the user and uh, the algorithm itself. So what we are investigating now is uh, if neurofeedback can help in uh, this scope. And with that, I thank you for your attention and uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Antonio, for your presentation. Before going on with the questions, I would like to ask you if you can repeat, uh, if you can show and repeat what you say about uh, slide number seven, because we had some problems with your audio. Mm, so we okay. can start and understand. Yes, this one, you mean? Yeah, thank you. Okay, in this slide, I am showing that uh, um, a simple concept with which you can implement a brain computer interface is to use a flickering icon. And this flickering icon is uh, evoking in the brain of the user, uh, sorry, the animation is not starting, but it can evoke in the um, brain of the user an oscillation. And this oscillation is at the same frequency of the flickering. So you can detect the flickering icon by measuring the, the frequency of the oscillation. And this is the concept that lies under the steady state visual evoked potentials. Okay, thank you very much. We have a few questions from our audience. Um, so the first one is, which kind of neural network models do you use in your applications? Are they standard models or ad hoc models? Oh, okay, well, here the, the kind of, uh, let's say, classifier or feature extractor is not so complicated because you have to think that also the computational efficiency of the algorithm is important for the life mm -hmm. applications. So for example, in the, this SSVP case, I just use a subtle vector machine. That's not really a, real ne a neural network, it's a classic machine learning algorithm. And that's just done to classify uh, the power spectral densities. So each signal is described with a dot in a plane and you try to fit the best line that separates these dots. So the red from the blue. In the other case, it is a bit more complicated, but the concept is still the same. Uh, here, the classifier is a naive Bayesian classifier, but at the end, it could be also a subtle vector machine. So nothing very complicated. The features are different. So you don't have only the temporal information with the filter bank, but also the spatial information. Okay. So the second question, what is the current limit to complexity of the patterns that can be distinguished? Oh, well, the fact is that um, in terms of patterns, uh, if I got correctly the question, for the yeah. motor imagery, it's not really clear which are the main patterns because they strongly depend on the user. So the great limit here is that depending on the user, there is a great intersubject variability and also an intrasubject variability because depending on the day, if you are tired or not tired, the activity can change. So there is, there is not a clear pattern. 
while in the reactive BCIs, the patterns are quite clear because you just measure oscillations. So in that case, you find something that is quite intuitive and clear, an oscillation, a flickering frequency. <coughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, in the future, do you forecast the possibility of recognizing any human tough? Oh, well, okay. I think we are very far from that. Uh, sometimes you hear someone speaking of decoding thought, and I also said something like, I'm reading the thought. Uh, but we are a bit far. Um, I saw some researches uh, measuring, for example, what you're dreaming. But typically, these use um, invasive technology because the signal quality is better, and you do something like reading a single neuron. If you want to build something like uh, the systems I showed, we are very, very far. Okay. We still have two questions. Uh, the first one is, does the time the person uses the system influence the accuracy? The accuracy? Yes, indeed. For example, in this uh, case study that I'm showing now in the slide, I always do 100% because I used it for months. And so I'm very, let's say, I can use the system very well and the system can recognize me very well. So the training okay. is crucial. Okay, and the last question, what would be needed to use this interface the opposite way to generate tasks in the human brain? Uh, okay, this is something <laughs> that goes to electrical stimulation. It is very interesting. And now um, I'm speaking, uh, maybe also the scientific community is more concerned on something that reads. But some, sometimes you see something that uh, tries to stimulate the brains or the neurons. And so you will need something like uh, electrostimulation or magnetic stimulation to do. Okay. So, so to install I, this tool. Thank you. I think we do not have any other question. Okay, so thank you very much, Antonio. We Thanks can uh, move to the second speaker. Yes. The second speaker is uh, Davide Romanin from the Department of Applied Science and Technology, and he will give a speech entitled Electronic Properties of Field Effect Dope Phonon Mediated super Superconductors, an ab initio study. Davide has recently finished his PhD programs in physics at Politecnico di Torino in Italy and will obtain his degree in early 2021, supervised by Professor Dario Daghero, in collaboration with Professor Matteo Calandra from University of Trento. He contacted, conducted theoretical research concerning electron phone interactions in low dimensional carbon system with emphasis on superconductivity and charge density waves. <clears throat> he worked also in close collaboration with the SMIM experimental group at Politecnico di Torino, led by Professor Renato Gonnelli, providing theoretical interpretation of experimental data obtained from transport measurement in superconducting materials <coughs> and nanolayers of transition, transition metal decalgogenides. In the last year, he became also interested in a theoretical treatment of optical properties of materials, and he is now a postdoctoral fellow, fellow at the Institute of Nanoscience at the Sorbonne University of Paris. Please, David. Okay. Thank you, Yuri. Uh, I will share my screen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so good evening, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Yuri, for the introduction. Uh, today, I would like to briefly discuss uh, with you uh, my part, a part of my PhD work uh, that I carried on in the last three years at Politecnico, uh, that is the theoretical uh, study of how electronic properties of uh, phonon-mediated superconductors can be controlled and modified by field effect doping. Now, first of all, I will discuss what is field effect doping, and then also uh, I will talk about the theoretical and computational technique that I use in my research, as well as the ab initio implementation of the field effect uh, architecture uh, in, uh, in this technique. And I will also briefly recap the, phonon pre the physical principles behind phonon-mediated superconductivity. And finally, I will discuss two case studies. Uh, I will discuss an insulator, in particular diamond thin films, and a metal, niobium nitride thin films. Now, 
we are interested in finding a way to control uh, uh, correlated phases of matter without uh, uh, the inclusion of other chemical species inside uh, our system. Uh, this can be achieved via field effect doping, which consists in the modulation of the conducting properties of a material by means uh, of a um, transverse electric field, which can induce charges in the first few layers of, our, of, our, of a material. The uh, experimental setup is that of a field effect transistor. We have a metallic gate through which we can apply, um, we can tune an electric field via uh, a gate voltage, a dielectric, and the system under study. Moreover, if instead of a solid dielectric, we use a liquid or a gel electrolyte, we can exploit the formation of an ADL, an electric double layer, at the interface between the electrolyte and the uh, material, uh, which acts as a nanocapacitor. Therefore, the electric field uh, becomes very uh, high in magnitude, and we, we can achieve uh, uh, induced charges, which are one or two order magnitudes higher than solid state dielectric devices. Now, how can we study electronic and vibrational properties of materials? Well, in the case of a solid, uh, the usual quantum mechanical approach of solving the Schrodinger equation and finding eigenvalues and eigenvector becomes very uh, complicated and unfeasible due to the huge number of electrons present in a solid and due to correlation between electrons. However, density functional theory allows us to overcome this issue by writing an energy functional in terms of the electronic density density. And uh, uh, moreover, in the Consham approximation, we map the difficult many-body interacting problem into a simpler non-interacting one, where all the uh, difficult many-body uh, interaction are put inside a, an ad hoc functional, which is called exchange correlation functional, which is chosen depending on the material and on what we have uh, to simulate. After that, we just need to solve the uh, Consham equations in a self-consistent way in order to reach the minimum of this energy functional and retrieve the ground state electronic density from which we can extrapolate uh, the uh, equilibrium properties of our system. Moreover, this technique is called ab initio because the only ingredients that we need are the uh, crystallographic and chemical information of our system and of the elements that compose the material. Now, Usually, the theoretical simulation of field effect doping has been accomplished by uniformly uh, spread charges inside the system. However, this is not what physically happens since the induced charge is not uh, homogeneously spread inside the system. And uh, because uh, this way, in this way, we cannot simulate the uh, sudden drop voltage at the interface between the um, system and the gate structure. And moreover, we cannot have uh, uh, the symmetry given by the field effect transistor architecture. Therefore, recently, a model has been uh, implemented in uh, uh, DFT codes, which treat the ionic layer or the metallic gate as a uniform dis planar distribution of charges. The dielectric is completely removed and a potential barrier is inserted in order to avoid charge spilling from the system into vacuum. And finally, uh, if we work with a plane wave uh, uh, implementation of uh, DFT, uh, the system is periodically repeated in all the directions. So in order to simulate a surface, we need to insert vacuum between uh, uh, different repetition of the system in order to uh, break the, um, periodic, the periodicity along one direction, for example, the, the one perpendicular to the surface. Therefore, the Coulomb interaction is also truncated in order to avoid spurious interaction with periodically repeated images uh, along the non-periodic direction. Now, uh, we know that uh, in uh, normal material, normal metals, the uh, resistivity decreases as we decrease temperature until it reaches a, a constant value. However, in a superconductor, the uh, resistivity decreases until it reaches a critical temperature where the resistivity suddenly drops to zero. Therefore, superconductor, for example, can be uh, exploited in order to reduce energy losses, for example. Uh, moreover, in phonon-mediated superconductor, 
we have an interaction between electrons here in this GIF, they are uh, blue dots, the blue spheres, which interact with uh, the underlying vibrating lattice, here the red dots. Now, uh, the normal modes of the vibrating lattice are called phonons, and two electrons can exchange a phonon in order to form what is called the Cooper pair. Now, the Cooper pair um, has an extension which can uh, be very large with respect to uh, atomic atomic distances, and this is called uh, coherence length, which is nowadays exploited for circuits for quantum computers, for example. Now, as a first example, I, want, I would like to discuss uh, diamond. Now, why diamond? Because in 2004, it was shown that if we dop the bulk diamond with boron, then we can achieve first an insulator to metal phase transition, and then a superconductive phase transition with a critical temperature of around 4 Kelvin. However, uh, even if theoretical predictions suggest that this critical temperature can be enhanced, can be uh, raised by incrementing the amount of boron inside uh, diamond, there is a solubility limit uh, due to the um, amount of boron that we can incorporate chemically into the closely packed structure of diamond. Therefore, we ask ourselves, can we dope it via field effect and still achieve a superconductive phase transition? We tried to answer this question in uh, um, diamond thin films along the 111 direction, more specifically in these two papers. And why we chose the 111 direction? Because uh, it is the one that, uh, in principle, should be able to uh, get uh, to accumulate more charge as possible with respect to the other two. Now, we have studied three doping regimes, low, medium, and high. Let's start with the low doping. Uh, here I'm showing you the electronic band structure in reciprocal space. The black line is the uh, dispersion of uh, the surface, while the gray shaded region are the bulk uh, projected over the surface. Therefore, we can say that we have electronic states at the Fermi level here, the blue, the blue line, if the black line falls inside the gray shaded region. Otherwise, it is called surface-like uh, state. Now, we can see, we can clearly see that the black line falls inside the gray shaded region. Therefore, at low doping, the system acts as bulk-like. And this is also uh, confirmed by the induced charge density. Here, negative oscillation correspond to uh, accumulation of holes. Indeed, we are studying whole doping of our system. And we can see that the induced charge density spreads well inside the system. Indeed, the 70, uh, 75, 80 percent of our, the total induced charge density is reached around the four, five, uh, fifth um, atomic layer. Indeed, if, uh, if we also look at how much each carbon layer contributes to the electronic states at the Fermi level, we can see that uh, the highest contribution comes from the third uh, atomic layer, uh, therefore meaning that the uh, system uh, the actually is mapped into a bulk, okay? Now, if we move into uh, to medium dopings, we can see that this time the electronic band structure at the Fermi level is outside the gray shaded region. Therefore, we have a surface like system. And the electronic fluctuations of the induced charge density indeed starts to be uh, very close to the surface uh, layers. And 75% is reached around the third, fourth. Uh, carbon layer. Indeed, this time the highest contribution uh, is not very uh, clear to some atomic layer. Indeed, we have a, a sort of uh, uh, equivalent contribution from all uh, the first three carbon layers, meaning that we are moving towards a, a perfect uh, surface-like system. Finally, at high dopings, the system, again, is completely surface-like. The charge fluctuations are strongly localized around the first two carbon layers. Uh, and indeed, the highest contribution at the Fermi level comes from the first and the second, while the third is just one half um, with respect to the other two. However, uh, superconductive phase transition 
cannot couldn't be uh, located for uh, low and medium uh, dopings, but only for high dopings. Indeed, what we predicted was that uh, at high dopings, this system could achieve a critical temperature of 40 Kelvin. However, uh, what's the problem? This could not be uh, seen experimentally. Indeed, ex up to now, the uh, technique that we have uh, allows us to um, probe the low and medium doping regime. Uh, so maybe in the future, uh, it will be possible also to probe a high doping regime and to see if actually we could achieve 40 Kelvin of superconductive phase transition. Uh, as a next uh, case study, I would like to discuss niobium nitride, which is a conventional superconductor with a bulk critical temperature of 16 Kelvin. Now, what we, uh, we can see is that uh, um, if we apply a field effect doping, if we if dope the system via field effect, as discussed before, we can achieve a shifting of the critical temperature, which, can be, which are reversible. Indeed, we have suppression or enhancements of the critical temperature, depending if we dope the system with electrons or holes. Now, you have to think that we are doping just the first few layers of our system, okay? So what we measure, however, is a bulk property. Therefore, the first few layers of our material are affecting the whole bulk of the system. And this is called superconductive proximity effect. Now, the um, depth, the penetration depth of the electric field uh, should correspond approximately to one angstrom according to Thomas Fermi theory of uh, screening. However, in a precedent work, they have fitted the experimental results and they've shown that for low doping regime, indeed, the penetration depth of the electric field uh, satisfies the Thomas Fermi theory. However, it increases uh, if we go to higher induced charge density, meaning that we are breaking Thomas Fermi approximation of screening. So we have tackled this problem uh, from a density functional point of view. Here I'm showing you the total density, the to total electronic density, and here the induced charge density as a function of doping. Moreover, we have the same thing here for uh, color maps along a slice of our system. And you can see that if we increase the uh, doping, uh, the fluctuation at the, uh, at the beginning, they are just localized around the first uh, layer, the first two layers actually, which is more or less one angstrom, therefore satisfying Thomas Fermi theory. However, when we go to higher doping regime, uh, the charge penetrates inside the system, breaking Thomas Fermi approximation. Indeed, this is caused by a sort of uh, polarization of atomic orbitals. So, so we have tried to give uh, to compare the experimental results here, the uh, black dots, uh, with a nonlinear Thomas Fermi model and with DFT uh, results. We can see that the nonlinear Thomas Fermi results uh, actually uh, can be uh, used for moderate medium doping regime. However, when we go to high doping regime, the nonlinear Thomas Fermi breaks. On the other end, DFT results qualitatively well describe uh, the, um, the behavior, the trend of experimental results. Therefore, we can see that so there is an anomalous screening of nio in uh, niobium nitride and in, uh, uh, let's say, in uh, conventional superconductors, phono-mediated superconductors, um, that goes beyond the Thomas Fermi approximation. So in conclusion, we have seen that ab initio techniques such as density functional theory allows us to predict electronic properties of materials. Thanks to field effect doping, we can modify the conducting properties of a sample without the inclusion of external dopants. And finally, computational models let us simulate what happens in field effect transistor architecture in great details. Uh, as a finish, I would like to acknowledge the uh, people that have helped me during the PhD, uh, in particular, uh, Professor Renato Gonnelli, Professor Dario Daghero, Professor Giovanni Marino, and Dr. Eri Piatti from Politecnico di Torino, uh, which are, who are expert in the uh, experimental measurements of uh, transport properties of superconductors in field effect uh, geometry, and Professor Matteo Calandra from University of Trento, who, held, uh, who have helped me uh, during uh, the PhD uh, for what concerned the theoretical part. 
And I would like to thank you for your attention. If you are interested in more application of DFT uh, in material science, you can go to my website. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Davide, for your very interesting talk. We have, uh, again, a few questions. Okay. So the, the first one is, uh, you said you, insert, you, said you inserted vacuum in order to break the periodicity of the system. Yeah. Why not yeah. to exploit a 2D periodicity? Because, um, okay, it depends on the code that you use. Because uh, when you use plane waves, all the theory is based on uh, three-dimensional periodicity of the system. Uh, in order to recover 2D periodicity, you have to mimic it. Uh, I mean, you create a fake three-dimensional system so, uh, so that you have vacuum along the Z direction, for example, okay, and while the system is correctly repeated along the uh, X and Y. So it's a sort of uh, computational trick to simulate uh, two-dimensional periodic systems. Okay, second question. Uh, which are the technical challenges when probing high doping structures? Uh, from what point of view? Theoretical or experimental? Because theoretical, uh, uh, I don't have, uh, okay, theoretically, I don't have any problem. I mean, theoretically, I can do whatever I want. Uh, <laughs> but if I have to uh, compare myself with experiments, now, um, Professor Gonelli and Dr. Eri Piatti, they have tried to do uh, measurements uh, on, uh, on diamond thin films. The problem uh, lies on, first of all, on the type of electrolyte that you use. So let me go a little bit uh, back. Yeah. Here. So it depends, first of all, on the type of electrolytes. So the better is the electrolyte, the better is, let's say, how uh, charges can move and accumulate. Then there is a second problem, which is an intrinsic proper, uh, problem of the material, uh, which is actually called quantum capacitance. So uh, if you, you have a sort of uh, capacitor uh, due to the system uh, itself, which is uh, in series with the uh, capacitance of the ideal. So uh, it depends on, let's say, of this quantum capacitance of the material, which reduces the effective capacitance uh, of the system, uh, uh, of the total system. And therefore, uh, you, see, you, you know that if I reduce the, the capacitance, then I reduce the amount of charge that then I can accumulate. So if we can find a way to overcome this issue, then uh, in principle, we can achieve higher, uh, proper, uh, higher induced charge densities. Okay. Uh, well, I, I, we still have two questions. I move to the last one because I think it's more consistent. Uh, which instrumentation is used to perform experimental measurements? Do you need atomic force or Kelvin probe microscopies? Well, it depends what you want to do. Uh, atomic force uh, microscopy is used just for probing the topology uh, of, your, of your system. I mean, you can also, in principle, uh, atomic force microscopy, you can use it uh, in contact mode for, or, or tapping mode for uh, looking at the profiles of, of your sample. Then you can use it also in, uh, um, you can use it uh, in resistive mode in order to, to, to see how, what is the, electrical, the, the, the electric resistance at each point. However, if you want to probe the, um, to study the transport properties, you see, you just create a, a, indeed a transistor, um, uh, sorry, a field effect transistor. So you also add a source of the drain, you apply a, transverse voltage uh, along the source and drain contacts so that the uh, induced charge density, so you are probing uh, just the, the induced charge density at the surface uh, and you can actually study uh, the conduction properties of these 2D electron uh, gas. Okay. Uh, well, we have the last question which yeah. is connected with this answer. Did you characterize the possible transistor electronic properties in terms of current voltage characteristics? Uh, from, okay, again, from experimental point of view, right? Yeah. I assume. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, you, you can study it. Uh, you, you, you will have a curve, uh, which is uh, uh, current versus uh, resistance uh, or temperature, whatever. Yeah, so you actually, uh, 
what, what you give is uh, uh, indeed actually what you what you are studying is the voltage as a function of, of temperature because you inject a certain uh, certain current and you see when for example the resistance drops to zero okay 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 thank you very much i think we do not have any other question okay so i will stop sharing it Thank you, Davida, for your talk and for the for answering all the questions. We can move to, to the to the last speaker for today, which is who is uh, Elisa Fevola from the Electronics and Telecommunications Department, and she will give a speech entitled "Data Driven Patient Patient Specific Cardiovascular Modeling for Early Detection of Coron Coronary Artery Disease." Elisa Fevola received her master's degree in electronics engineering from Politecnico di Torino and her master of science in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Illinois at Chicago, both in 2018. She is a PhD student in the Department of Electronics and Telecommunications at Politecnico di Torino, where she works on reduced order modeling for cardiovascular applications. For her research project, she collaborates with the International School of Advanced Studies in Trieste which she visited from September to December 2019, and with the University of Toronto, of Toronto, which she visited from February to October 2020. Please, Elisa. I will share my screen. Okay, so thank you, Yuri, for the introduction. And today I will introduce to you some of the topics related to my PhD research, which is about cardiovascular modeling for the early detection of coronary artery disease. So to give you a bit of context about my research, we are talking about uh, cardiovascular disease, which is the leading cause of mortality worldwide. Among cardiovascular disease, we concentrate on coronary artery disease, which affect those arteries in charge of bringing oxygenated blood to the heart. Uh, here, the, um, there is a tendency of, of uh, fat to deposit into those arteries so they can get occluded and this may lead to a blockage and then heart failure. So when this happens, the most common surgical treatment is called bypass grafting, where some arteries or veins are taken from the patients and they're used to bypass the blockage so that the blood can still perfuse the heart. However, data show that up to 60% of grafts fail to work some years after surgery. And the reasons behind such failures today are still unknown. So what we want to do is to use computational fluid dynamics to investigate the mechanisms behind graft failures. As you can imagine, this problem is quite complex. So there are many steps and many actors that come into play. In particular, we, have a, we need to do a recruitment phase where we recruit patients. And on this patient, then some uh, surgeons, some doctors will perform the surgery to do bypass grafting approximately one month and then one year after the surgery, some medical imaging is performed on those patients from uh, by radiologists so that uh, data are gathered and they can be sent to us, so to engineers that perform CFD modeling. Once we have our um, cardiovascular models, we can then get back to doctors so that they can evaluate the, the clinical uh, value of our results the clinical aspect of relevance of our results. So in our specific case for our project, we collaborate with the Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto and the St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, who take care both of the recruitment, the surgery and the medical imaging phase. While for the CFD modeling, we collaborate actively with the University of Toronto and with the International School of Advanced Studies in Trieste. So you may ask, how can we go from like the sick patient to the cardiovascular model? So when, once we have the patient, we can perform, as I said, some medical imaging on him or her. So usually we do CT scan and um, so computer tomography scan and also what is called a 4D flow MRI, which is a particular type of magnetic resonance imaging. From the data we gather through medical imaging, we are able to reconstruct a 3D uh, model of the vessels of interest. And on this 3D model, we can then build a mesh, um, tetrahedral mesh, so that we're able to use finite element modeling to solve uh, some equations that describe the, um, the motion of fluids 
also of blood into our vessels. In particular, these equations are Stokes equations or Navier-Stokes equations. The use of mathematical model is really powerful because once we solve it, we can retrieve both velocity and pressure point-wise in our domain. So we know exactly in each point of our vessel, which is the velocity of the blood, which is the pressure. And this allows us to compute afterwards some quantities, some indicators that tells us how the graft is working, how the blood is flowing, and so to make some consideration on the performance of the graft and its possible failure. So this is the state of the art pipeline, but there are still some steps here that need further investigation, that need further research. One of this is in the mathematical model phase. In fact, uh, when we set a mathematical model, we have to choose what are called boundary conditions. It's in this step that we can take inspiration and help from circuit modeling to, to model what is happening outside our 3D model, our 3D domain. However, this phase of setting the boundary condition is uh, crucial and also really delicate because if boundary conditions are not set properly, uh, they have a huge influence on the results of our model and they can screw up our entire our entire simulation. So our results are not accurate at all. So what we're trying to do, what we're trying to address is how to choose uh, the best boundary conditions that make our cardiovascular model as accurate as possible. So uh, some details about boundary conditions. So what they are, why do we need them? When we solve a uh, partial differential equation problems, we need bound to set boundary conditions to end up with a unique solution of the problem. And also boundary conditions have the, um, uh, um, have the, they need to model whatever happens outside our domain of interest. So uh, here we have like an aortic arch, this is the aorta and we have the supraortic branches as well. What we set usually it's an inlet boundary condition, which is the, um, usually it's a velocity because we know the inlet profile, the velocity profile, so how the blood, blood enters our domain. Then we set what is called the wall boundary condition. So we um, impose the velocity to be zero on the walls of the vessels because um, blood like sticks to the to the walls and it's still there, and uh, and then we have to set the outlet boundary conditions. And here we have different possibilities. Either we can uh, fix the pressure of the, or the velocity at the outlet, and it is called Dirichlet boundary condition. So we prescribe a um, certain value of pressure or velocity, or we can impose what is called the Neumann boundary condition, where we impose a certain value for the stress and this is equivalent as modeling the discharge of blood into, into the into reservoir. Another possibility that is quite interesting is instead using lumped parameter network. We can do this because we can exploit the well-known uh, analogy between the hydraulic domain and the electric domain. In fact, if we find an analogy between pressure in the hydraulic domain and voltage in the electric domain, as well as between flow rate and current, we can also find a sort of duals for the main electric quantities, such as resistance, inductance, and capacitance, but in the hydraulic domain. The resistance, for example, can be compared to blood viscosity, so it's something that prevents our blood from flowing easily. Inductance is like blood inertia, so something that the ability that blood has to flow even in absence of pressure. And capacitance instead is like wall compliance. So the ability that um, vessel walls have to enlarge in order to accommodate more blood. This means that we can set as boundary conditions some simple circuit, for example, a simple resistance or an RRC circuit on an RC circuit. And this allows us to uh, model much more precisely what's happening outside our domain. However, this brings another problem. So how do we choose the values for such resistances and capacitances? And that's Pro this problem is far from trivial. Uh, one idea is to use some patient-specific measurements, so some data that we have directly from our patient to help us, to guide us into choosing those values. 
So uh, this leads us to the second problem that I'm introducing in the initial pipeline, and it's connected to medical imaging. So as I told you, we perform a CT scan that allows us to know exactly how the vessels of our patients are, are built so we can reconstruct them in 3D, but we also perform what is called the 4D flow MRI. And this type of magnetic resonance imaging allows us to know both the temporal and the spatial evolution of blood into our domain. So we know how blood blood is flowing in time and in space. This is a lot of information, a lot of powerful information that we will be, that we will like to introduce into our mathematical model to make it as, um, as close as possible to what's really happening inside our patient. So our second question is how can we assimilate those patient specific data into our model to make it as accurate as possible? And um, this, this problem is taken care of by a whole mathematical branch that is called data simulation. And what data simulation does is exactly this. So it finds a process, it's a process of finding like the, the model representation that best suits a set of data, what's called the observation. And uh, so uh, in order to properly do the data simulation, we start from a set of patient specific data, what is called observation. And through an assimilation process, we introduce those data into our mathematical model. So that in the end, our model will give improved results that are close to reality. To give you more, a bit more detail about the type of data we have in our projects, they come from this cutting edge technology is really advanced. It's a new type of uh, magnetic resonance called 4D flow MRI. And as you can see, we can, uh, we know it's called 4D flow because we know both the 3D uh, spatial evolution, but also the temporal evolution. So um, it's in four dimension and we can reconstruct the blood flow of um, inside all our domain. So our region of interest. There are different uh, techniques to do data simulation. For example, you can use a Kalman filter, but what we decided to use is uh, optimal control, the optimal control problem. So to introduce you to optimal control, we start with a really simple example that is called the rocket car example. Assume we have a rocket car in the point A in space at time equal to zero. And on this uh, rocket car, we can impose a thrust, so a, a force that we call U that is variable in both direction and it's, um, it's bounded. And what we want to do is that for the rocket car to reach point B in space in time capital T, so this is the data we have at our um, available. And the question we're trying to answer is what is the minimal time capital T that the rockets need to reach point B? So this is, seems really trivial example and it is, but uh, we can recast it in a different way so that it's uh, a simple optimal control problem. In fact, this problem can be reformulated in this way. So minimize the time T subject to the following constraint. And we have the equation of motion, we have the position and the velocity of the rocket at the beginning, the position and the velocity at the, at the end, and we have a constraint on the, on the force on the thrust. So what we have precisely is a cost functional that we're trying to minimize. And this cost functional is constrained to set a differential equation. In this case, it's an initial value problem. And uh, we then have what is called a control function, which is a variable that we can change in order to, uh, for the problem to reach the minimum. So it's the variable we can act on. And then we have a set of additional constraints. So even if this example is really easy, it's trivial, it's actually an optimal control because the basic ingredients that we have in order for a problem to be an optimal control problem is to have a cost functional to be minimized that it constrained to a set of differential equations, usually partial differential equations. And you also always need a control function. So what we decided to do is to use the optimal control to tackle both the problems that I introduced to you before. So for assimilating data coming from 4D flow MRI, but also for selecting automatically uh, the outlet resistive boundary conditions. So what I'm solving, as I told you, is a still an optimal control problem. So we'll have a cost functional that I'm trying to minimize, which will be constrained to a set of uh, state equation. In my case, is the uh, Stokes equations, which uh, uh, model the motion of blood into our vessels. In this case, I'm working on the aortic arch. 
and um, I will reach the minimum by changing uh, control functions u. In this case, the control functions are the resistances used as the outlet boundary conditions. How do I? Uh, how am I able to assimilate data into thanks to optimal control problem? Well, you can see the answer in the cost functional. So my cost functional is the difference between uh, is the I'm trying to minimize the norm of the difference between the velocity, which is the state variable coming from Stokes, the Stokes solution, and uh, the 4D flow MRI data. So the velocities that I measured on my patient, and I'm also minimizing the difference between the Stokes pressure, the variable coming from Stokes equation, and the average pressure that we measured from the patients. So uh, what this optimal control problem is able to do is at the same time inserting assimilating data coming from the patient so that the um, Stokes solution that will be chosen from our problem will be the one clo as close as possible to the patient-specific data. At the same time, the optimal control will choose automatically the um, control variable, so the resistive, the outlet boundary condition, so I'm not left with the, with the choice, the problem of choosing boundary conditions. Um, in a clinical setting nowadays, uh, in fact, what is done is to do a manual tuning in order to choose the resistances at the outlet. So there is an operator that uh, knows the values of, for example, velocities in the patients and it changes the resistances accordingly, simulating over and over again uh, navier Stokes problem or Stokes problem until the solutions match the um, the data coming from the patient. So in this way, instead, um, the selection is automated. I can show you some results of this tool that we propose. You have here the pressure that is coming out of the optimal control and the velocity. And uh, the data that I'm assimilating is the average pressure measured all over my domain, and then the flow rates uh, uh, measured at the outlet of the supraortic branches. So where I'm also trying to impose uh, to find the resistive boundary conditions. Uh, to give you more quantitative data, here you have the patient measurement. So what the pressure that we measured on the patient and then the flow rates at the outlet. And you see how the control values in the second row are really close to the, um, to the measurement. So the relative error is always less than 10%. This means that our control, our optimal control problem is correctly assimilating data measurement data. Uh, as a reference, I also reported here the values that you would reach using manual tuning, and uh, you see how far you would be with respect to patient measurements. So there, there's a um, there's a convenience in using optimal control. And as a reference here, also I reported the resistive, the, the values of the resistive boundary condition that you would choose with manual tuning versus the one that optimal control chooses for you. So to conclude, I, uh, what's next on this project, we uh, want to apply this optimal control tool on coronary artery bypass grafts. I only showed it to you on the aortic arch and there are some challenges in bringing uh, this tool on the graph since the graphs are really small, there are not a lot of measurements there, but we're hopeful that it will work out. And we want also to speed up simulation using reduced order modeling. Uh, another project I'm working on, which I didn't present today, is how can we set boundary conditions where instead of the measurements that I, we have are really noisy or corrupted or we don't have any measurements at all. At all. And in this case, we propose to use um, technique based uh, only on a minimum energy principle, so no data involved. So thank you so much for your attention. And if you have any question, feel free to ask or write me an email. Thank you very much, Elisa. We already have three questions. So I go with the first one. How do you plan to enhance the reliability of the bypass graphs? Oh, okay. So in like my, the final goal of my PhD is not to make graphs more reliable. I don't have this type of claim. It's just more on the modeling part and to make uh, the modeling as accurate as possible. And then hopefully from the results we have, the analysis we have on the graphs uh, one year and one month after surgery, like our uh, goal is to make the, uh, the modeling accurate and then uh, our like the 
doctors, our colleagues can work on making the graphs more working okay. better, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Second question, uh, which is the advantage of employing an electrical model to represent the problem? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, the, um, um, uh, using a circuit instead of using just prescribing the velocity or the pressure at the outlet, it's much more realistic because it, uh, it models better what's happening inside our, our body. So if you, use, um, if you use a resistance, for example, you're not saying the pressure is a certain value or the velocity is a certain value at the outlet, but you're just prescribing a relationship between pressure and blood at the outlet. And that's more similar to what's happening inside our body. And if you can insert also a capacitance, for example, you can also model how the, um, the blood vessels uh, enlarge and restrict uh, with the um, beating, the heart beating. So it's, uh, that's why it's more realistic. Okay. And uh, the last question, how many patient, patients have been selected for the, for the data processing? Okay, so the entire project uh, in the Sunnybrook Hospital and University of Toronto has a total of uh, 30 patients. Uh, that have been uh, like they um, had surgery and then uh, they had CT and MRI done one month after surgery and one year after surgery. And um, yeah, we plan on using the whole cohort if possible. So around 30 patients. Okay, I see there is another new question. Uh, are there any cases where data simulation leads to worse results? For what I experienced, no, like uh, it's uh, when it, data coming from patients are so rare and so precious in this um, type of uh, situation that um, they're really, um, it, it's always convenient to insert those data into our model and for sure it will be more close to reality. We don't have a lot of guidance into what's happening inside the human body in this sense. So if we have more data, usually it leads to more accurate um, solutions. Okay. Thank you very much, Elisa, for Thank your you. talk and for answering all the questions. I'm, uh, I'm asking to all the speakers to switch on their camera if they can, please. Thank you. Also to David. Thank you very much. So in general, we are, we are used to give some certification by hand, of course, but considering the situation, this is not possible. But we are giving you virtually some certifications. The attendees, I think I see, they are seeing it on the, on the YouTube live. So in this precise moment, we are giving you some certifications. We will give them as soon as possible, as soon as we can came back to our university and do like a ceremony for all the speakers that we had this year. So I would like to say thank you to all of you for uh, participating to this event, to present your, uh, for presenting these talks, very interesting talks. And I would like to uh, say thanks also to all the people who work behind the scenes the student branch and also the, the women engineering group, which is who is always uh, behind the scenes and always collaborate with uh, our uh, group. And of course, I, want, I, want, I also want to thank all the people who are attending the event. So they are uh, our audience. They always listen to our events and uh, ask questions. And uh, before concluding, I would like to say that uh, for the next month, we will have a special event in collaboration with UCDM, so the student branch of Rome. And uh, this is for us the first event uh, co-organized by two student branches. One is our student branch and the other one is the, the one from Rome. And we will also have the elections. So if some of you is interested in joining the board of the IEEE student branch and the board of the Women in Engineering Group, Please just let us know because we are very interested in uh, continuing this activity. And uh, that's, I think, everything for today. So thank you again for uh, joining this event and see you for the next event in December. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.